Uh, da, 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 da. Full screen mode. All right. Okay. So hi everyone, and welcome to lecture twenty-five of ECE thirty-three eleven principles of communication systems. Uh, so this lecture. Ah, so um, this is a very interesting lecture because this. Okay. Let, let me let me do some drawing because. I could do hand waving, or I can, um, or I can actually do drawing. And so, um, so in lecture twenty four, what did we see? Ah, well, we saw OFDM, right? Da 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 da. And what OFDM did, right, is we took single carrier. Okay, um, transmission. And what we did is we reorganized the data across time and frequency. Okay, such that we now got multi carrier. Right. Um, so what we ended up having was instead of a signal, so let's say that's FC, right? this is in frequency domain, and we had a signal that looked like this, right? And it had a bandwidth that bin, right? For the same amount of bandwidth, Centered at FC, we got this. So same bandwidth, uh, but now what we had is a whole bunch of subcarriers, right? We had N subcarriers. Okay, awesome carried the same amount of data. And so, so really it's like, what the hey, right? So same amount of data, same amount of data. And what ended up happening was we were trying to ask, it's like, why do we do this? Well, and the answer was, was the following. What happens is across that you know very wide uh, single carrier transmission, we might have <laughs> that's kind of extreme. Let's say frequency selective fading, frequency selective fading, right? Attenuation. Some some places the signal is not that attenuated that badly. Others is very very attenuated, right? And this had to be corrected with a very fancy smancy. Um, uh, uh, IIR uh, equalizer, which, or an extremely long FIR uh, equivalent, which there's not an equivalent, uh, but it's an approximation, doesn't do as well, hundreds or thousands of taps, kind of complicated, right? What we found here when we did multi carrier, okay, is that each sub carrier views the channel from a very narrow band perspective, right? Narrow band, right? And therefore it can approximate approximate as flat fading, which means that you correct it each subcarrier of one game, right? So the way you would represent this, let's look at it another way, because I like visualizing these things, is the following. So single carrier, I'm gonna add another dimension, okay? So let's say that's energy, okay? Um, ooh, that's time, and that's frequency. And so what happens is for single carrier, what we got is, let's suppose we have something here at FC. <coughs> here, mu. And so we would have a very wide band. Okay. 
Okay. And then we would have the next single carrier symbol. And then we would have the next single carrier symbol. Okay, and so on and so forth. So what happens is we have some sort of symbol duration, TS, that's for, the, uh, for this symbol. We have a bandwidth, I'm gonna call it B, right? Okay. And we have an energy level per symbol, let's say PS. Okay, cool, right, awesome. So uh, let's make some space here, boop, 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 time. Now, multi-carrier. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Caffeine. Looks like this. So what we do, we're a little sneaky. So, oh yeah, let's label this. Frequency, time, energy. So uh, first things first, um, I take the bandwidth. If I have N, N subcarriers, what do I do? Well, the bandwidth gets, the, gets sliced up. I know, this is such a hard diagram to draw as you'll see. <coughs> so each individual little guy there is B over N, but I messed up. It's more complicated than that. What more complicated? You betcha. So sure, bandwidth B over N. But remember when we demultiplexed in lecture 24 into a single subcarrier, what happens? We're taking one end of data and we're making each data stream one, uh, one um, where the, the data rate is one nth of what the high speed data stream is, which means that the symbol rate is n times as long. All right. So the symbol rate thingy, TS, is now NTS, and we do it for each one of these. Perfect, right, awesome. So, and then we, and then we do it for every other one until we have a total of N subcarriers that occupy, guess what? B bandwidth in total. I know. <laughs> this is really hard to draw. And what, so here, what happens is uh, to communicate the same amount of information uh, as this, right? 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 Uh, this would be. Like, so each individual OFDM symbol is that duration. Uh, what happens is all of these symbols here, if we want the equivalent amount of information as in the multi-carrier would be NTS long, right? So what I've just done, if you notice, is I've done nothing. I've just changed where the division of the information is. Do we slice it across time or do we slice it across frequency? All right. So, if you look at this, oh, and by the way, heads up, power still PS. So here, information content, okay, amount is the same. Super important. Remember, I, I brought this up, this term before, or if I didn't, I'm gonna bring it up now. This thing we refer to as the electrospace. I know that should almost this should almost be the name of a band. 
like now playing electro space <laughs> you know something like that electro space <laughs> Ooh, luck unfortunately i'm not musically inclined so so now you might say well that's it you could either move the information in the frequency domain or a time domain. I can either slice this one way or another. Eh, incorrect. What happens if I told you there was another way? <gasps> there is another Jedi, right? <laughs> B. Let's call this NTS, so N time domain symbol. And this is what we're going to do. I am going to transmit this massive B wide, right? And NTS long symbol, it's like, Holy smokes, can you do that? Absolutely, I can. I could definitely do that. But this is what I'm going to do. It is going to have PS over N, the amount of power. And better yet, oh, this gets better. I'm going to put on top of it. If I can draw another such way for, wait, 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 wait. Can you do that? Like, I, I, like, you know, throughout the course I was saying about how you can't transmit on the same subcarrier, right? One signal and then another signal, they're gonna interfere with each other. This is gonna be bad. Yeah, but there are tricks, right? And that's what today's lecture is about, is one of those wonderful tricks to be able to do that and then successfully extract it out and not pick up any interference, right? So at the end of the day, I can create, I can send N symbols, okay? Such that the aggregate power is PS, it's NTS long and it's B wide. But in this case, what happens is I'm superimposing one symbol over another symbol over another symbol over another symbol in this manner, right? And what happens is this, okay, is called, uh, if I can spell it right, spread spectrum. Where what happens is I spread the spectrum of a signal across frequency by a factor of n. So this signal was, pro was originally b over n. I spread it to across b, but at the same time, it had a transmit power of ps. It is now ps over n. And in both cases, in both cases, the duration is NTS. And then through the miracle of something called, okay, the PS sequence, pseudo, uh, pseudo noise sequence, okay, pseudo random noise sequence. What happens is I could do these little tricks to make sure that as I spread this signal across B at the receiver with the identical sequence, I could pull that out of all the other signals and leave everything else behind. Okay. So that's spread spectrum. So these are the three ways in the electrospace where I could really have a lot of fun in terms of changing my information, how it's spread out in these dimensions. There are other ways, but these are like kind of, these are kind of like the cool things. And um, spread spectrum, this type of spread spectrum. So you have 5G today and 4G and such like that. 3G, okay, 
So that was like around the late 1990s to 2000s. That that used spread spectrum. Okay. And so now what happens is let's look into this mystical thing called spread spectrum. All right. So let's dig in. So I just talked about that. So the spread spectrum works as follows. You have an information source. As with many things, let's go into, into baseband. Then this is that pseudo random binary noise sequence that we use and then send it through the channel, then demodulate with the same pseudo random binary noise sequence. Uh, demodulate from baseband signal to binary and then information sync. So you might say, well, okay, what's a pseudo random noise sequence? So the PN sequence works like this. So the way it works is, so suppose I have this I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take I'm going to take this thing okay let's say we have something that looks like this let's suppose that's my baseband sequence I'm I'm being super lazy here okay but I'm I'm, I'm just going to like I think just keeping it simple would would help for now zero let's say that's the first time period uh, time uh, symbol time period second symbol time period third symbol time period, fourth symbol time period, fifth symbol time period. Okay, boop, 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 boop. All righty. Okay, so the pseudo-random, okay, so this is my baseband. The PN looks like this. Uh, first of all, it had, it, it also, okay, it kind of looks, it will be rectangular, like, kind of like a rectangular pulse thing like this, but it's, period, okay, symbol period, okay, is not a symbol, we call it a chip. Mm -mm. Potato chips, okay? So uh, in this case, there's something called TC. So that's the chip period. And the thing about the chip period is the chip period is much, much smaller than TS. And the chips assume a value either plus or minus one. Okay, so it would look like something like this. And so on. So it's plus or minus one. And what do you do with that? You take your baseband signal, you take your, your PN sequence, and you multiply them together. What do you get? So this is, let's say, plus A minus A. This is plus or minus one. What do you get? Whenever you multiply plus one with your original baseband sequence, you get the value, right? So if it's plus A, it's plus A. If it's minus A, it's minus A. But when you multiply a portion of duration, at least one chip period by minus one, it flips. So at the end of the day, when you get baseband times PN sequence, you get something that looks like this. Yeah, Ooh. zero, TS, two TS, three TS, four TS, five TS. No. And what you'll get is this. <gasps> wow, doesn't that look like, yeah, it does. It kind of looks like the PN sequence. And, and the reason why we call it pseudo noise, okay, is initially the PN sequence. So, so the PN sequence itself does not look like it has a pattern. Right, it looks random. 
random pattern of plus and minus ones. Not, but it's not true. So what happens is the PN sequence is generated by shift registers. Okay. Or other logic. Okay. Such that like after several hundred of these chips, the pattern repeats and then repeats. But if you don't look at it long enough, it looks random. It's like, oh, just a bunch of plus and minus ones. Oh, it looks very random. Blah, 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 blah. No. But what happens is in the long term, if you constantly look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it, you'll see the same pattern over and over and over again. And that's what gets multiplied against your baseband signal. And so it's very, very important to have pseudo random, right? So random means absolutely it's just no rhyme or reason. There's statistics, but we don't know exactly what the sequence looks like. Pseudo-random means we do know, but we have to observe it for a very, very long period of time. Shift registers are great because you could use a combination of shift registers and XOR gates in order to create a variety of different patterns, as we'll see later in this lecture. But we do this multiplication, we get this resulting signal, we do this to a whole bunch of signals. And what we also do is we assign each transmitter. So this depends on multiple transmitters, each of one, each of which gets a different, very different PN sequence. Okay? Because here's the kicker. At the receiver, I'm going to have a, a mismatch of all these different PN sequences, uh, all these, uh, what we call, well, first of all, all these signals that are multiplied by PN sequences, right? But look what happens. I'm gonna do a very small segment because this is gonna be very hard to draw. Okay, so suppose we have this. Okay, so let's say that's our receipt, but and let's say this was actually that's a one, that's a zero, that's a zero, right? To extract out, let's say we would have to have the PN sequence, okay, matching at the receiver to extract out. And the way you do it is looking at this, how do we, how do, what the PN sequence was to modulate this. So, so think about it. If the transmit PN sequence to get this was the following, okay, so what was it? Okay, this segment here should have been one, okay. This mu must have been that. That must have been that. That must have been that. And then, uh, yeah, that must have been the inverse. Then up. Then that. 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 And then keep that. There we go. So that was the PN sequence. Sometimes it was go PRN for pseudo random noise sequence, but the PN sequence at transmitter. So if you multiply that against one, zero, one, zero, you'll get this fella here. If you multiply the PN sequence again, by itself, what do you get? This is so cool. <laughs> Let's see. 
Okay, what do you get when you have the PN sequence at the receiver? What happens when you multiply these two together? One. So how, how so? So one times one is one. Minus one times minus one, one. One times one, one. So you're either multiplying minus one minus one, which is one, or plus one plus one, which is one. Constant. And what do you get at the end of the day? One, zero, one, zero. And what's interesting is if you don't have the matching PN sequence, it's still going to be scrambled. It's still going to be, um, you know, this, this, this mishmash of like very rapidly changing ones and minus ones. So that, that's why this is so cool because you have to have the matching PN sequence. And that's also really important to have a very long PN sequence to make sure that you don't have a match with anybody else's PN sequence, right? Now, why do we call it spread spectrum? Well, this is why. So if we had this, that's our original signal. This is TS, right? What's the bandwidth of something like that? Well, approximately, it's going to be something that looks like, like, like this, right? Um, minus 1 over TS, something like that. What happens if now we spread it? Okay. What happens is now you've got the period is actually much, much less because it's now dictated by the chip period. What does the spectrum look like? What's one over some really small number? It's going to be a very big number. So one over TC and one over TC, it's going to be, and the power stays the same. The, no, sir, the overall power, if you integrate that spectrum, it's going to be the same, but it's going to be spread out by a factor of the ratio between TC and TS. So that's why we call it spread spectrum, because the spectrum, because of the much higher chip rate versus the symbol rate, sorry, uh, no, the, the chip period versus the symbol period, uh, what happens is this translates into the spectrum being much, 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 uh, much wider. All right. So let's go back to, to this guy. So that's what happens with spread spectrum. We take a signal, we really increase the period, right, of the individual components from, from just a simple period to the chip period, that will significantly increase the bandwidth, but it's also going to significantly reduce the energy. At the receiver, if you have the matching PN sequence, you can extract out your target, sim, uh, your target transmission. And if you don't have the matching, you're still just scrambling everything else around. It will still stay at one, at one nth the original transmit power, right? And so we go back to that other diagram, you know, the third diagram I drew of the electrospace, you get that. Okay, so that's one type of spread spectrum. There's actually another type and uh, it's called frequency hopping and that's actually used in Bluetooth. So Bluetooth spread spectrum, it's a little different. The way it works or just in general frequency hopping looks like this. So remember, you know, like OFDM, we had those subcarriers, right? But what happens is, let's say you transmit one symbol or you transmit several symbols across a duration T, right? The way this would work with frequency hopping. So, so what we just saw here, right? This thing is very specific. It's called direct sequence. So what happens is the chip, the pseudo random noise sequence is directly multiplied against your transmitted, transmitted um, baseband waveform. 
for frequency hopping, right? So FHSS. So this fella here is DSSS. What happens here is that for FHSS, your PN sequence dictates which carrier frequency you jump to. Huh, what? So, okay, so let's say all of this is centered at FC. But the way this works is every T seconds, you send a little bit of information. Let's say you start here. And then the PN sequence says, okay, now jump here. 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 Now jump here. And what it does is it's going to one of N subcarriers. But the funny thing is it's not subcarriers from the definition of OFDM or multi-carrier where we continuously have a data transmission. The way frequency hopping works is for a limited amount of time, it's on a subcarrier, it transmits, and then it goes to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. And it looks completely random. And there's a number of reasons. From an interference standpoint, if there was something interfering on one of those subcarriers, yeah, well, you might have a little bit of data corrupted, but all the other N minus one subcarriers, the data was successfully transmitted. From a security standpoint, if someone's trying to eavesdrop on your communications, because it's pseudo random, they, they can't like, unless they observe you for a very long time, they're unable to kind of figure out or unable to track where your transmissions are going because it's pseudo random. Well, it's random to them. It's not random to you. You know what the sequence is, or at least the receiver and the transmitter are aware of each other, right? So that's frequency hopping, right? All right. So, okay. So here's now the mathematics. Well, let me see. Oh my God. Yeah, this is, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the math a little bit here, okay? So the mathematics. So this is, this actually, I found that the presentation in Proacus and Salehi in communication systems engineering, the second edition was actually pretty good. So that's what we're using here. Um, you know, I think the course textbook has an okay presentation, but I like this one better, right? So what happens is this is our baseband. Oh yeah, and I'm using V of T. Isn't that also like, uh, yeah. So here in this case, it's not G of T, we're using V of T. This is how practice and Salehi defined it, okay? But what happens is my baseband signal looks like this. G of T and B of T. So, so this fella here, okay? Suppose that we, we have a bit rate. So we're just spreading some sort of binary, a binary waveform, right? So G of T could be rectangular, it could be sync, it could be anything, right? Um, and A, N is either plus or minus one or plus or minus A. The pseudo random sequence here, C of T, that's, that's, the, the, that's that high, like, so let's, well, I'm hand waving. Let's, I hate hand waving. Let's just do this. So my VT, okay. And this is AN. So let's say this guy here, rectangular pulse of duration zero to TV. A dictates plus or minus A, correct? Uh, here's N goes from minus infinity to infinity. And this, what this means is let's say if AN is some sequence from let's say A minus A minus A, 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 A minus A, da, 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 da. And you have this base waveform. What you get at the end of the day looks like this. So it'll look like da, 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 A, minus A, minus A, 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 minus A, and then da, 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 da. So what we got here, right, is, uh, is this sequence. This is V of T. This is our baseband sequence, right? From plus A to minus A amplitude. Now there's the chip sequence that's also described 
right? That's going to be this fella here. And this, this thing here, let's say the P of T, same thing, except that, so it's one, zero to TC. Okay. And I just want to see what's a T. Okay, so it's a two, 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 two. Let me. And here, this is the chip value, right? It's either plus or minus one. That's random, okay? That's or that's a pseudo random sequence that's generated by a shift register, P T N T C. So remember, T C here is much much less than T B. So this is going to look like D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D all the way home. And so the width of each one of these individual chips is TC. And the value here of plus one, minus one, these are dictated by whatever CN is equal to at value N. Okay. So the way this works. Is this. Ah, so here's pass bank. Okay, so proactive and say, eh, let's show what this looks like at pass bank. So, but this is exactly what happens. Take that, take that, multiply together, modulate to a carrier frequency. Boop. Okay, I already showed what this looks like, time and frequency domain, right? But this, right, chip, chip period, so this term I have not mentioned yet. So the ratio, okay? How many chips, it's almost like a joke. How many chips can you fit in a bit period? We call it the processing game. So, so, so the, amount, the amount of spreading that we can achieve, okay? With a pseudo noise, a pseudo random noise sequence versus the original sig uh, signal, right? The baseband signal, we call that the processing game. It's LC. Yeah. And then the spreading, ah, this is very important. That's exactly what I showed. If you take your pseudo random noise sequence and multiply it by itself, if it's a match, should be always one. Should be always one. You can mathematically prove it. That would be pretty awesome. But you could just graphically look at it and it would make exactly the same sense. All right. So this here, this is kind of getting somewhat sophisticated. And let me see, yeah. So this here, this is, this is kind of where like spread spectrum is pretty awesome, right? So let me graphically show why this is so awesome. I know, I have a very messed up definition of what awesome is. Huh. So this is what happens. So let's say spectrally, Here's my spread spectrum signal. So let's say this is my spreaded signal. Spread. Okay. And suppose that's some interference. Under normal circumstances, if I had a signal and then I had interference, OFDM or single carrier, it would be like, ah, you know, it would be very, very difficult to handle that. That, that would be really messing up the reception of my, my, my transmission. Spread spectrum, uh-uh, no, right? Because what happens? What does the signal model look like? Here, this is what the signal model looks like. So let's say my received signal is going to be equal to AC, VT, CT, cosine 2 pi fc of t plus i of t. This fella here, and it is its name. Oh, So what do you do? Well, I have to unspread. Again, huge assumptions. Um, I have perfect sync. I know where they are. So that's the kicker, perfect sync, right? Um, the problem about the chip sequence is it really 
uh, 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 varies very, very super duper quickly, right? Chip period, not bit period or symbol period. So now imagine trying to get a lock and try to align coherently, multiplying one chip sequence exactly with itself at the receiver. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of difficult. So what ends up happening is, let's say the first thing is I want to de-spread. De-spread. You do this. Meep, 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 meep. So you get this. And you get that. This, super important. So we know that is equal to uno, it's equal to one. This, what happened? What's happening there? I'm spreading my interference signal. <laughs> so, so what happens here? Let's look at it. What's happening here? Uh, boop. What's happening? When I despread, is this is AC. Ah, shucks. This is my despreaded signal. Right? And as for my interference, That's a spreaded, that's a spreaded version of that. So that's my interference signal, spreaded. So you might say, okay, so big deal. So what? Well, what happens is the impact that it has on my original signal is now one uh, is one nth. Like if I have like n, so okay, let's put it another way. LC, that's my processing gain. So that's the ratio between TC and TB, if this is a binary modulation scheme, right? What happens is before I had like under any other circumstances, I had a whole bunch of interference power and it's being, in, it's being injected into my signal, right? But by unspreading the desired signal, right? And spreading my interference signal, what I've effectively done is only this amount, which is one LC. <laughs> Jeez. So if we take the amount of energy that the interference signal had, right, and divided by LC, that's what's actually influencing. So imagine if the processing gain was something like 1024. Now I have 1024th the amount of interference power affecting my transmission. I can go with that. That's awesome. So that is the beautiful power of spread spectrum. Because now what I've got is that, that across that transmission bandwidth, um, my interference power has basically been nullified by quite a bit. And so that's the relationship we have here. So the interference power is now uh, one uh, is PI over LC. Okay. So what did we learn in this lecture? Well, we learned quite a bit in terms of, so first of all, very importantly, we saw single carrier versus multi-carrier versus spread spectrum and how they each, when we send multiple symbols across frequency and time and energy, they all get manipulated across different dimensions. We then looked more closely into the direct sequence spread spectrum domain. And we saw how, okay, with that in particular, uh, we saw how the dimensions kind of all kind of like, like if we use a chip sequence, we, we, we uh, take the sequence and we spread it out in frequency, right? And, and the energy density actually gets reduced by the amount that we spread, which is the processing gain. Um, and then what we saw is the advantage of that when we deal with, let's say, an interference signal. We also saw if we have multiple signals and if we stack them, and we didn't see that. So let me just draw that very quickly, okay? If we had multiple signals across the same bandwidth, so let's say FC, let's cross B. <sighs> FC, we could have one, two, three. 
right? We can host a whole bunch of transmissions and each one has a unique PN sequence. Right? And then with the right PN sequence, you can extract out one while keeping the others still in like, you know, spreaded and minimal impact on my, on my receiver. Uh, rece like, you know, in terms of the amount of interference power it introduces. Okay, so that concludes lecture 25 of ECE 3311. We just covered spread spectrum, the direct sequence spread spectrum at least. And uh, it's really interesting to see how over, over the last several decades, people have been manipulating space, sorry, frequency, time, and energy in order to pack in information in different ways. And each one of these techniques have different advantages and disadvantages. One of the main disadvantages of spread spectrum is, oh, shucks, I got to synchronize to the chip sequence. Oh, boy, that's going to be very tricky. The other thing about spread spectrum, obviously, is how do you make PN sequences random enough? Right, because there are issues where if you don't have enough randomness, someone else might be picking up partially your signal. Who cares about reading it? But uh, it won't it won't fully despread, but it'll be enough despreading that could cause a lot of problems. So with that, uh, that concludes lecture twenty five. Okay. Yeah.